morning. So good morning, She's everyone. She's an early morning person. Yes, good morning, everyone. Today is the 5th of July, uh, 2020. Yesterday was Independence Day, so happy Independence Day, Lisa. And thank you, yes. everyone, for being here. Tania, Raj, Lourdes, Roxana, Edison, Ruben, Priscilla, Angela, Karen, uh, iPhone de Irma, and Angela Reina. This morning, we have a very special speaker, as usual, uh, Lisa Wakefield. Uh, graduated from Grand Canyon University in Phoenix, Arizona, with a master's in secondary ESL teaching. She has taught high school ESL for 30 years. In 2017 and 2018, Lisa was an English language fellow in Peru, in Lima, Peru. She worked uh, with the Ministry of Education and conducted teacher training in several regions of the country, including my city, Pura. Uh, she has recently worked in Chile, uh, training educators in the Patagonia area. She currently is teaching secondary ESL in Arizona. Her students come from all over the world and speak many different languages. So let's give her a warm round of virtual applauses. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lisa, for your time. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you all for being here on a Sunday morning and giving up your time. Um, I completely appreciate it. Uh, I use a different platform online at school, um, so I'm going to work on Zoom here. I think I'm pretty good, but bear with me if there's any technological issues. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. As usual, please, if you have a question, a comment, uh, something you want to say, just let me know through the chat. And I will allow you to, well, she, Lisa will allow you to speak. Thanks. OK, sorry, guys. Take your time. There is no hurry. All right, let's see if I got my screen up now. It's not there. I'm sorry, I'm not finding my background that I want. Don't worry, don't worry. We got plenty of time. Let me make sure I have the chat box open too so that I can. Okay, whoops, we don't want that there. All right, so I'm going to present on differentiation today, and this presentation is actually going to be two parts. So, a little background on differentiation. I hope it's not. Um, something you already know too much about. And then from there, I'm going to go into something called choice boards. And these are my beautiful grandchildren, because you know, if you start a slideshow with babies, everyone is happy and smiling and you want everyone to be happy. So we became grandparents just a little over a year ago and we have twins. So this is Emery and Sage. All right, so reaching all your students by differentiating instruction. And our objectives today are to explain what differentiation is, state the three parts of the lesson to differentiate, and think of a topic or a lesson that you can differentiate, and we'll kind of talk through that a little bit. And then I want to show you something called choice boards, where some, they are something I learned this spring when we had to go online in the United States. Um, due to COVID. And I just think they're a super cool idea and work well for online instruction and differentiating. So I want you to, can you guys see that clearly or do I need to um, put it in present mode? Oh, I guess if you put it in present mode, that would be better. Okay. Is that good? Yeah. Okay. So I want you to read these challenges that we all have in our classroom with students. And I want you to associate a name of one of your students with each of these challenges. So just take a couple minutes and read them and think of a kid in your class. Lisa, just part of the PowerPoint is a little obscured. Oh no, it's okay, I got it.
So for me, Beatrice and Karen are two young ladies I have um, who require more time. They just seem to struggle a little bit and they need extra time in class than everyone else. Um, and a little background on my students. I teach um, English as a second language at the high school level. And my students are from all over the United, I mean, all over the world. So I have students from Afghanistan, Syria, um, different regions of Africa, Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras. It's a mishmash, it's a melting pot. So it's a very diverse classroom with several languages spoken. Um, and then students who bring with them great reservoirs of knowledge. Last year, I got this student from Mexico named Jocelyn, who spoke no English. And I realized as time went on that Jocelyn was brilliant. She one day was showing how she made flashcards to study some of her notes. And I was like, oh my gosh, who taught her that? You know, it's just the skills she had. And then need to move around. Oh my gosh, I have Aaron. He can't sit. And every time we do a review activity that involves games, it's the best for him because he'll be standing up, moving around, and he really learns well that way. Um, I have a boy named Ivan. It's just so sad. He has given up on school, doesn't really care to be there. He's lethargic. Um, and then concentrating, I have a girl from, named Yvonne. She just really lacks focus when I'm teaching and it's really hard to get her back in. And poor test takers. I have this girl named Gertrude who will take everything home, study so diligently. And then when she takes the test, she doesn't do as well as I think she should or she thinks she should and just feels a little defeated. And I'm always trying to encourage her going, oh no, you did great. You know, look at how hard you studied. Um, and then students who won't engage with learning if they don't see the point. I have a boy named Raphael this year. You know, if he didn't see a point to it, he wasn't going to do it. Do you have students like that in your class? I think it really points out how different our students are and how their needs are so different. And as teachers, we need to understand that and do some things to help all of our students learn. Um, this is a video I really like. It's by, um, I can't remember if this one's Larry Falazzo, but it's just a five minute video and it really brings home what differentiated instruction is and how simple it can be for us. And what I did with this video is I turned it into an Ed Puzzle. Does anyone know what an Ed Puzzle is? Okay, it's a new thing I've learned and I wanted to share it with you especially if you're teaching online, it's a way to take a video like YouTube, or you can take any video off the internet or a video you make, and then you go in and edit it and you can put in questions so that it's more interactive for your students. So I'm gonna make this interactive for you so that you have to pay attention because it's early in Arizona. Um, so we're gonna watch this and there'll be some times to uh, stop and answer some questions. And I have a wakelet for you at the very end with all the resources. So um, I don't know if I put Ed Puzzle in the wakelet, but here we go. Here we go. Everyone see that okay? Yes. Okay. Yep. I'm Larry Falazzo. Differentiating instruction. To some educators, it conjures visions of having to create a different lesson for every student in the room and long nights of planning and grading. That insanity is not what differentiation is all about. Differentiating instruction is really a way of thinking, not a pre-planned list of strategies. Oftentimes, it is making decisions in the moment based on this mindset. It's recognizing that, to paraphrase Rick Wormley, fair doesn't always mean treating everyone equally. It's all right, so what does it mean when he says fair does not always mean treating everyone equally? You can either type something in the chat box or we can just speak out loud, whatever you're comfortable with. 
What do you think that statement means? Fair doesn't always mean treating everyone equally. Anybody wants to talk? Me, I don't know if I am uh, in the right way, but I would say that not always all the all people need have the same needs. So we as teachers maybe say, I am going to be um, uh, to make justice with my students, giving them all the same, and that is not the idea because all of them are completely different. So that is not an idea of equality. That is the the real goal that we must pursue. It. I love it. Yeah. Other thoughts? Yeah, me, Nora. Go ahead, Nora. Yeah, I, it's almost uh, like uh, like she said that uh, when and my students say me, we are not the same, no? Uh, so and they know that uh, if you are not unfair if you treat them different because um, as a teacher, a mother or even the students they know that they have um, different needs and also I, there are students that they have special needs mm -hmm. and they they need more of our attention and you are not unfair if you treat them different you are um, you are uh, being good no and yeah yeah Okay. I love that quote. Something else? Can I say something? Yes, please do. Okay, and but we are just, uh, from what I heard, they are talking, this, uh, our colleagues are uh, talking about special needs. But what about the person who is uh, above um, the regular uh, student, okay? Because that is another need, okay? It's, it's uh, it, it, I, I, in my case, I have m m students in the same level, beginners, but they, I have four or five who are far better than the rest. And, I, I, and there are no levels to be moved up. It's, everybody studies the same level. And that is not because of their needs as a disadvantage, but as in, on the, it's the, just the opposite. Yeah, I think you have a valid point. It's not just the lower need students, it's also the higher needs. So fair doesn't mean equal. So those higher need kids might need a little different instruction or a little more challenging instruction or a little different type of instruction. For me, sometimes in my classroom, I'm walking around and that student who's really struggling with the language, I'll just look at them and go, you know, I just want you to do three of these. Just do three. And that three is just as challenging, as difficult as the other students that are maybe doing six questions. Um, again, fair is not always equal. It's equally hard. They're doing equally, the work equally because they're doing the same work. It's just maybe I'm scaffolding it or changing it a little bit for a lower or higher level student. But yeah, your point is very valid. We have to figure out how to, um, challenge those kids that are higher. Yeah, I Lisa, Katia and, Katia and Lima, sorry, Raj. She says, being fair with our students means to respect them and respect the form they learn. Not everybody learns at the same pace. Mm -hmm. Please go ahead, Raj. Wait, well, I think I was going to say fair means we believe everybody's got the same start, but not everybody gets the same start. And therefore, we want to respond differently. Yeah. Yeah. We want fair instruction, but that doesn't mean everyone's going to be able to do it in the equal, equally the same pace mm -hmm. or, you know, that might be another way to look at it. Mm -hmm. Any other idea? This, so this is Edpuzzle where it will stop and ask a question and you can do open-ended questions, yes, no questions, things like that. And I think this is brilliant for going online that if your students are having to watch something and again for those lower level learners they can go back and re-watch if they need to if they didn't get the idea they can watch it again for our high students they can just keep plugging away at their own pace okay um so oops i gotta figure out how to go forward now this is new technology um 
I'm just going to type in So I put in an answer so I can go. I can't. I, and then there's a submit button. So, mm. and then can. It's recognizing that all of our students bring different gifts and challenges. And that as educators, we need to recognize those differences and use our professional judgment to flexibly respond to them in our teaching. Carol Tomlinson talks about the ability to differentiate in three areas, content, process, and product. For content, student choice is one way we might differentiate, like allowing students to choose their research topics or essay prompts. Okay, so here's your next question. What is one way to differentiate content? What would you say? Do you remember from the video? That students are able to choose their own topics for research. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna click that and hit submit. And then you can put in a comment there for your students so they know. And so I put in correct. Okay, so yeah, one way is give students some choice. That's a way to differentiate the content. So we're gonna continue. As teachers, we need to keep our eyes on the prize. In other words, we have to keep asking ourselves, what are the main learning objectives? One day, my students were writing an argument essay about what would be the worst natural disaster to experience. John's head was down the desk. He was not doing anything. I knew that he was interested in football, so I told him that he could write an essay on why his favorite team was the best. He would still have to make an argument just about football instead of hurricanes or earthquakes. His eyes lit up. He got to work and wrote what his mother later told me was the first essay he had ever written in school. He had followed all the guidelines of a good argument essay. The prize in this case was learning to write an argument essay, not learning to write about natural disasters. Okay, here's your question. Why was the student motivated to write his essay? And again, we can, you can type or you can talk. Uh, okay, the, the, the principal idea um, is um, does not to give up on the students, but to give them choices. And in this case, um, be careful or care or be careful about what it, you, uh, every single student likes or dislikes and then take advantage of that and in this case he he was uh, uh, the objective was to write an argumentative essay right right the topic changed but eventually the objective was achieved so he was motivated because he could choose the topic uh -huh. Yeah, that's, I think that uh, it, it, it's empowering students. Yes, I love it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, here's, you know, this is a perfect example where um, they had to write an essay and it had to be an argument essay and it was about natural disasters and this kid had no interest and the teacher just looked at him and said, hey, write about football, but you've got to write an argument essay and now all of a sudden the kid's motivated to work. So sometimes it's just taking something little like that and making that shift um, in your thinking as a teacher to get your students motivated and willing to do what you want them to do. All right, other thoughts? Yeah, um, Cecilia Mayanga says because he didn't do it, he hadn't done it before. Uh, Priscilla says uh, it's interest of students. Angela Reina says, because it is closely related to his interest. Yeah. And Nora Lozada says, he likes football, so his essay was about it. And Ruben says, his motivation was aroused by a topic which he's, passion he's passionate about. And isn't that fun when you mm -hmm. can give kids the chance to do something they're passionate about and they're excited about? Years ago, we, um, or a couple of years ago, we read this, unit on civil rights and we were learning about the civil rights and uh, the amendments and everything and we read an article on the death penalty and i asked my class i said would you like to know more about the death penalty in america and they're like yes I'm like okay why don't you take a stance and research it and decide if you're for or against it oh my gosh i had kids coming over miss wakefield you gotta watch this video look what it says here i mean there were so excited about the learning and I gave them the choice. 
and yet it's still related to the content I was teaching. Okay, so we're going to continue here. To differentiate by process, teachers can change up how they group students. Sometimes a mixed ability group might work best, while sometimes it might be appropriate to have same ability groups. We might have an English proficient buddy work with an English language learner to help them out. So what's, which is the correct answer for differentiating by process? Mix up groupings or give students a choice? Could you ask the question again? Yes, which is an example of differentiating by process? Mixing up groupings of students or giving students the choice of work? Giving them the choice, maybe, I'm not sure. Okay, let's see. Can you guys see the questions on your screen? No. Oh, pretty, not really. The font is pretty small, so. Okay. Yeah. So on my screen, it's pretty big. So if I say that one and I hit submit, it's going to say, oh, it's this one. So um, it is actually grouping students. So you can see how students will get immediate feedback. During independent reading time in my early morning class several years ago, one student tended to fall asleep. I told him that if he wanted, he would go to the back and sit on a desk and read. Soon, several others joined him. A few days later, I saw another student dozing off. Before I could say anything, one of his classmates whispered to him, just go sit on a desk. Again, it's a matter of keeping our eyes on the prize. What are the learning objectives and what are the best roads to get there for different students? Teachers can also differentiate by the type of product students create. The major demonstration of learning doesn't always have to be an essay or a multiple choice test. One year I had a student who liked to doodle when other students or I were talking. I told her it was okay as long as she was doodling about the information we were discussing. She built on those doodles to create a final project that brilliantly and visually represented all the key points we had covered. Okay, so here's the next question if you can't see it. What are the ways to differentiate product in your class? The last part. So you can either type in the chat box or we can just talk. So we've got content we can differentiate, process we can differentiate, and then the final product. Process. Mm -hmm. So students can get, um, can decide the way they, they present their product. Okay. So they can make a video or they can write an essay. They, they can write a, let's say a podcast, they can use a podcast maybe, or maybe an infograph, an infograph, I don't know how to give that. Yeah. So they, they can, a, a, if we allow them to, to go through this process, uh, they, we, they can have the, the, the power to decide not only in, uh, in the way they, they are gonna process the information, sorry, but in the way they present their final product, like in project-based learning, okay? So they exactly. decide. Uh -huh. Yeah, again, it's going and giving those students that choice. How do you want to prove to me you learned what I taught? Here's some different ideas. But but I have one 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 question. And there are is there something some strategy or a, a technique to make them get the same or something similar regarding the okay in this in the case of of of, of getting the the, the content. Okay, there is one way the teacher teaches and everybody knows that content, but the way they present is different. Because at some time we have to go from some controlled practice to less controlled practice, let's say. But what is the, let's say, the balance in, in, the, in that process? Are you talking about in the, in the teaching of the content or the practice? Um, more in the practice because 
um, sometimes we need as as the as the policies of the schools are uh, are given to us. Right. We need to cover specific contents, right. um, and we are given uh, the test uh, by the school. Let's say. Yeah. So we can have some uh, let's say projects, mini projects. Uh, in their own way, but the, we we also need to uh, fulfill the requirements of the school or institution where you are working. So, True. how it's, do you balance that? Yeah, I I think that's I think that's one of the beauties I love about being a teacher. I and you're going to see a little bit later on, like a, a unit I put together, um, and we have standards. So these are the things we have to teach. But I think, in, at least in my case here, I have the flexibility to teach how I want to teach as long as I teach to that standard that the state sets for me. And so I think that's one of the things I love about being a teacher is once I get in my classroom, I know these are the things I have to do, but I have some freedom in there of how I do it and the types of, um, hands-on learning I might incorporate or the different ways that I'll have students practice. And I think we'll come back to that. So keep that thought in your mind because we're going to go through this a little more in detail and then maybe um, we'll answer that a little bit more. If not, we'll have a discussion on it at the end. So keep it there. Okay, so I'm going to submit this one and continue. When I give tests, I often give students an extra blank page where they can write anything else they remember about the topic being tested that they think is important. I often find the quality of thinking and writing better there than in response to my test questions. None of the differentiating strategies I've mentioned have created any extra work for me. They did require that I had relationships with my students to know their strengths, challenges, and interests and I needed to demonstrate flexibility in my thinking. So to differentiate instruction, teachers need to be what? Flexible in their thinking and know students or spend hours planning different lessons? Flexibility. Exactly. I love how he says, you know, I, I don't want you to spend hours coming up with several different lessons, but that at the moment, at the time when you're in there with students, to know your students and then to be able to flex and change things up. As I said, I'll walk around the room sometimes and just go, okay, let's change this a little bit for you because that student's really struggling and maybe what I've given the whole class is just too much for this one student. So I'll back it off or I'll say, take out your notes and use those. So I think it's knowing where your students' strengths and weaknesses are and being able to adapt and change and not be so rigid, as he says. Okay, we're almost done with this. We're going to finish. Making these strategies successful also required building a strong class culture so that some of the students were being treated differently and they understood why. And they understood that that was the only way to be truly fair. The ideas mentioned here are just a drop in the bucket. There are a zillion other ways we can support our students' gifts and challenges. We just need to keep our minds and ears open. So I put that video in a, in a wake clip for you so that you can actually, if, without the, all the stops in it, so that if you want to show it to colleagues or you just want it as a reference, it's there for you. Um, but the little Ed puzzle where it stops and makes you answer questions, do you think that would work for your students online? Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, it's something you could, um, you could Google it. It's, it looks fancier than it really is. It's fairly basic to use. So if you Googled, you know, Ed puzzle, I'm sure you could find a little tutorial if it's something you think is interesting to you or might be useful. I just know in this online environment, I'm trying to figure out everything I can that might be more user friendly for my students and engage them. So what is differentiation? 
It is a teacher's response to the learner's needs and providing opportunities for them to work at their level. And as you guys said, that could be the high level students or the lower level students. Doesn't just mean our, our struggling students. It's the recognition of students varying background knowledge and preferences. For me, this is huge because I have students who are coming from refugee camps, um, maybe have had very little formal education. And it's instruction that appeals to the students' differences. Um, like the video um, shows that, you know, that one boy, just a really quick change of the topic appealed to him and what he liked and motivated him to learn. I, for years, have taught a reading class where we work through units. Again, we're kind of, this is our book and we're kind of told this is what we have to do. Um, and as I work through those topics, sometimes students will ask me really great questions that I don't know the answers to. So I started a parking lot in the back of my room. I just have a piece of paper. And then if students have a question regarding that topic that they wonder or want to know more about, they write it on the parking lot. And then the goal is to take time later in the year, look at all the questions we've asked and let them research it and teach each other about it. Again, getting to their interest in what they want to know, because I don't always know what they want to know as a teacher. And then they'll come up, hey, what about this? Do you know how this works? I'm like, no, write it down. Write it on the parking lot. We'll come back to it. All right. So teachers can differentiate three things which the video reviewed, content, process, and product. And I kind of look at those, well, I'll tell you about how I look at them in a minute. And then we differentiate according to the student's readiness. How ready are they to learn that content based on their background? Um, we can differentiate according to their interest and their learning style or their learning profile. So I'm gonna break this down a little bit. So the content is what the student needs to learn or how he or she will access the information. So for me, this is what the state tells me. Okay, these are your standards. These are the things the students have to learn this year in your class. So I kind of think of that as the what. The process are the activities in which the student engages to make sense of the information and master it. So um, as you were saying earlier, what you're doing once you teach the content, those practices, the how. And then the products, I think of this as kind of like our assessment or measurement, the culminating projects in which the student rehearses, applies, or extends what he or she learned. So, when we're differentiating content, that can be really challenging. So one way is to use reading materials at different levels. Um, I have discovered over the last few years something called newzella.com. And again, it will be in the wakelet at the end as a resource. And it gives you reading at different lexile levels. So I can assign the same topic or same content but at different levels of reading. So this one might be, this student might get a little lower level, this student the average level, and then the high students could have the more difficult reading. So that's one way to differentiate content is changing the levels of reading. Maybe putting it on tape where the student listens to it um, if they're a struggling reader. Using spelling or vocabulary list at the levels of the students, you know, maybe not everyone's ready to do 30 words or 20 words. And so maybe you have to cut that list back a little bit, less words for some students. Remember, fair is not always equal. Mm -hmm. So 10 words may be just as challenging for some kids as 20 are for others. And then presenting information through visual means Boy, when we went online last year, I really learned how important that was. And so I started using Screencastify and I would walk my students through things with a little video of myself doing it and modeling it. Um, a lot of times I show, if I'm teaching a grammar lesson, I pull up a fun video just to introduce that content because my students love videos. 
So they're just glued to the video of watching it, um, especially if there's any singing or anything like that and they can repeat. Using manipulatives, um, sometimes I've taught where I give students pictures before we start reading and I make them talk through um, what do they see in the picture? What word might that relate to? And then I give them the words and then they match the word, the vocabulary words that are in the reading with the picture and we see if they can figure it out. So it's very manipulative, moving things around and visual. And then also meeting with small groups. I know some of you have really large classes. Um, but a lot of times I'll put my students in groups to work together so that I can get around to five groups instead of 25 students. And then I can really work with those ones that are struggling. So those are some ways to differentiate content. Any other ideas or things you've done? Anybody? And if not, that's okay. This is kind of a research-based, just background information for you. So the next is differentiating process. And I really think about this as scaffolding and how you scaffold what you give students. And I think this will come along <laughs> with some of the discussion questions. So using tiered activities, all learners working with the same understanding and skill, but with different levels of support or challenges. Uh, I can remember teaching an essay and working with my students on an essay. And, and in our district, in our state, it's four to five paragraphs, intro, body, and conclusion. And you know, I always have struggling writers. So sometimes I would tell this student, okay, for you this time, I just want three paragraphs. One intro, one body, one conclusion. And I would know that if I could get them to write three, then I could eventually add in that extra body pat paragraph to make it four. But for right now, I just needed them to practice mm -hmm. that format. Well, so, just can I say something? Yes, please. Oh, sorry for interrupting. Sorry. You're not interrupting. Yeah, but I, I did once or twice is what I, what I ask my students, for example, for their oral presentations. We have show and tell things in college level in so, but they were, I, 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 I liked to work with beginners. Yeah. Uh, Pray intermediate students. So, but what I did is, uh, let's say they had to talk about their free time activities. But for lower learners, uh, for struggling students, what I did was to ask them to write more words in the patterns and in each slide. And with more advanced students at the same level, they had to to use fewer words so that, as a guide. So that, because the idea was to make them uh, develop the presentation techniques. Perfect. To be able to to work in front of people, but not exactly uh, all the things. But they, they they had this visual aid. Yes. But the number of words included in each slide was different. So yeah. so they could get some extra help, let's say, although it is not help, but what they needed. So for your kids, for your kids, your students, your adults. Adult. <laughs> yeah. your adults Young adults. adults. For who had less language, they were able to have more words so that they could depend on those to practice speaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And had more English, had to go more from their memory and their ability to use the language. Yes, they could use, let's say, I give one, them, let's say, uh, 20 words and 10 words yeah that's perfect so, so they so uh, uh, there were people like uh, who just had five and they the key keywords and then they with the help of the images on these keywords they kept on working and i said you had maximum to have five or six slides no more than that yeah, and that's exactly what it means to differentiate the process and scaffold that so students can be successful. Again, your goal was that everyone got up and spoke and everyone did that just with different supports and what they were allowed to do. I love it, that's perfect. Thank you for sharing that example. Um, 
you and this kind of goes along with you using graphic organizers giving copies of notes um, students had more notes less notes sometimes in my class and this can go also with content or process sometimes if i'm introducing a content and i have kids who haven't been in school a lot and they don't know how to look at a board and copy things really quickly I give them notes with a lot of it filled in and then they just have to put in two or three words, whereas the rest of the class is having to copy more. So since my notes are in presentations, it's easy just to delete a few words and print that copy and give it to students. So, uh, yeah. Kathy in Lima says, word maps are really useful. Yes, yes, you are so correct. And then um, creating interest centers that encourage students to explore more. This is kind of where I said I put the parking lot in the back of my room and students can go write notes of things they want to know and learn more about so that they're excited of something to come and something to do in the future. Mm -hmm. um, this is one I, may I Oh, go ahead. Sorry, may I share a, a comment? And yes. also a part of a question. Um, once I remember a group of adults who were uh, trying to refresh their contents in English because this, this group was actually a group of English teachers. So I don't know if you're familiar with the book, uh, How to Teach English to English Teachers, Mary Spratt. Anyway, so for me it was a challenge because I was thinking to myself, I'm much younger, how I'm gonna be teaching to these teachers that have probably more than 20 teaching experience. Oh so God. My, yeah, so uh, the only way that I thought I was going to be able to accomplish the goal and at the same time, let them, let them use their own expertise was forgetting about all the teaching grammar or teaching vocabulary or how to create a reading writing activity or listen speaking activity that was included in the book so i just gave the general instructions i of course model my own activities but at the same time say okay now you are going to create your own activities probably the ones that you feel more comfortable with with your own students and then you're going to model assuming that we are all your students so you can have the practice with us. And I think it worked beautifully. I yes. think that was part of the, uh, um, you know, having the flexibility of, yes, you have to work with a book because that's the policy of the university or any institution that you're working at. But at the same time, you need to know what your students need. And this group was actually needing only the practice of you know, getting more fluent with their language. So I thought uh, that the best way was, you know, letting them use what they knew and it was their own activities that they created. Of course, first they needed a model and it was very, very rewarding for me to see that they were copying some of the exercises, adapting some of the exercises, but then I learned a lot because they had more than 20 years of teaching experience. So they taught me a lot. And I think that's mainly the relationship that you want with your students. You learn with them and you learn how to adapt to your own teaching style because of them. And I think that's the most rewarding situation that you can get in a class. That's, that's, a, that's brilliant, my comment. That's a brilliant statement. I love that. This original presentation I did in Chile last about a year ago, and I took a bunch of teachers and I taught, I, I taught this. And then really what I did is I gave them time to then take topics that they teach. And I, same thing, I modeled a lesson plan and this had some other parts to it. We did like a three part training. And so at the end of the day, they had a completed lesson plan on a topic they teach with differentiation pieces in it. And we also did a little bit on task-based learning so and student-centered. So they had a lesson that involved students, had um, 
their assessment was a task and then they differentiated. And I think that's the real world. What, what do teachers need? They need time, they need to practice and use and what they practice they can take back and use because it's one thing to get the training, but if you have time to play with it and develop it, that then you have something ready to take back. That is so much more valuable. So what you did, I'm sure they appreciated greatly. Um, and I had, I went back to teach at my high school that I graduated from about 15 or 16 years ago. And at that time, the state of Arizona said every teacher had to have a class in what they called structured English immersion, which was working with students whose first language wasn't English. Every teacher in the state had to take a college course. So the teachers on my campus said, Lisa, will you teach that to us? And I'm like, oh, are you kidding? So I taught a night class for my teachers and some of the teachers in there were my high school teachers. And I was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, I am teaching my teachers. And then I had to grade their work. That was the freakiest thing. <laughs> so, I know I, the pressure. Yes, yes. They were so it's appreciative. A lot of pressure. <laughs> so the other thing, and this is one thing I really love and use a lot in my classroom, is creating sentence frames for writing. So I almost always scaffold my instruction with a start, a sentence starter, or a sentence frame. So kids can continue, especially if I'm teaching vocabulary and I'm wanting them to practice using that vocabulary, I'll give them a sentence starter and then they can just kind of keep going with it. Um, super valuable for teaching that process of writing. And then providing manipulatives or hands-on materials. That's just another great way um, for my beginners. Years ago, I would take a vocabulary word on a card and I'd have the definition on another card, and then I would have it used in context on a third card, and I would just give them a pile. And they would sit in groups, and they would kind of almost do like a matching game. They'd take the definition, put the word that goes with it, and the sentence that it's used incorrectly, and they'd move them all around on their desk and lay them out. So it was very much hands-on and manipulative. So these are some ways, and there are just a few ways to differentiate the process of instruction. And then I have an example. I'm going to move you guys over here. So this is a practice I made, and we had just learned comparative and superlative adjectives and adverbs. And so I gave them some notes here to remind them when they use the comparative or superlative, and then Here's their words, and then there's the little topics. So they just got dice, they rolled, and they played the game. And the goal was to practice speaking using the comparative and superlative adjectives. So this was for my average student to high average. Well, I have some really struggling students in that class that I knew couldn't do this. So I simply just, when I made a copy of this, I added to it. I'm gonna move you guys again a little bit. So same objective, but this one gives students more help. Um, I know my learners, I know how they struggle. So I differentiated by actually giving them a choice. They could use best or better. I told them use cutest here. I told them use friendlier here, use more popular. So I gave them, and then I different, made this a little different. I just said most, most, worst. This way they could still play the game, but they had the extra support they needed. And again, my goal was, were they speaking and using those? So it was a very simple way to change it up. Didn't take me hours. Any questions on that? Okay, so those are some ways to differentiate the process. And then let's look at products. And we've talked a little bit about this already, giving your students options on how to express the required learning. Um, you know, they can make something, they can write a letter, they can create a puppet show. Uh, you, um, as you did this where you had them with their product, they were allowed to use more words or less words. You totally differentiated the product. 
using a different rubric with the student skills, kind of like what I said with the essay. If I were to require some kids to write a three paragraph versus a four or five, my rubric for grading would just be different, that they only needed one body paragraph instead of two. Allowing students to work alone or in groups to complete something, that's another great way. Um, I think I've gotten smarter over the years as a teacher and realized that we work together. We collaborate, we talk, we figure things out with our peers. We don't always work in isolation. And why do we make students do that? So allowing them to work together, I tell them two brains, three brains is much better than one. Work with a partner, figure it out together. This is real world. It's part of those 21st century learning skills to collaborate, communicate. Encourage students to come up with something of their own as long as it fits the requirements. I do this from time to time where I say, you know, here's things you need to do for your grade and you can pick and choose what you want. And if you have a better idea, talk to me and we'll talk it through. And as long as it meets what, what the objective is, then if you have something more creative than me, go for it. So I wanna show you a picture. This is my reading class. And actually, I think this is a summative. I probably should have put summative, not formative. This is a test my students have to take. Like you guys said, there are certain things you have to do with your students. This is a computer generated test that goes with our program. They're very hard. They're not written for second language learners. Um, so they're pretty challenging. And so a few years ago, I just went, you know, I really want my students to think. The goal is that they can think and process the information. And sometimes I feel like when I give a test like this, some students just quit or they give up or they just half read or they don't give me 100% and I want 100% for my students. So I, they came in one day and I said, guess what? You have a test today, you guys know that, but you're gonna take it with a partner. And they looked at me, their eyes just got gigantic. And I said, I'm gonna give you your partner and you both have to read every passage and then you have to discuss the questions and come up with the answers together and you need to come to consensus. Um, and then you are to choose the same answer. So you're both to each, they each have a laptop so they're each putting in their own answers um, and then that's your grade. And the next day I said, what did you think of this? And they're like, we liked it. And I said, why? They said it was less stressful. We got to talk about it. And they, I said, do you wanna do it again? They went, yeah. So I, in this particular class, I have been letting them take the test in partners. And it's so cool to watch them sit there and go, no, right here it says this. I think it's this one. And isn't that what we want? Don't we want them thinking and talking and not just rushing through a test and making guesses? Mm -hmm. So um, again, it was totally thinking outside that box and being flexible and knowing my students and knowing this might be better for them. So a, a way to kind of change up that product. Thoughts, questions? Uh, Irma and me, we agree that formative assessment with a partner, that's great because they can interchange, they can interact, they can learn from each other, and that's yeah. great. Yeah. You know, one of my, I mean, it's funny you say that because one of my students, when we went online in March, I said, what have you guys learned about being online and what's going on in your life and stuff? And one of my students said to me, Mrs. Wakefield, I have learned that we learn from each other and I miss being with my friends in class because we learn from each other. And I thought, wow, how cool is that? It's a way to develop real life skills, you know? Yes. Yeah. yes. And that's kind of when I was thinking through this and going, you know, these tests are so hard, they're defeating. Um, I just went, what do I do as a teacher 
I talk to you guys. We, we plan things together. We figure out things together. That's what we do in the workforce. And that's real life. And I thought, I want my students to leave my class with those collaboration skills, those thinking skills, not just rushing through a test and not thinking. And so this forced them to think. So it was pretty fun. Okay, yes, I'll yes, go ahead. Question, sorry, Lisa. Is that the way, could you show the picture again? Is that, the, is that the way your class looks? Yeah. It looks, I don't know if it is a stereotype, but it looks like a Latin American class. As far as this, the type of kids? Everything. Or, oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, that's my classroom. So for test days, they're in groups of two. When they're not in a test day, they're in groups of four, which I don't know how this is going to work next year. Um, but they have, I put four desks together. I don't know, can you guys see me? I put four desks together. So they have a partner, a face partner, and a shoulder partner, and they have to speak to each other. Yeah. Now, I don't know what's going to happen. Katia, we... Katia Drancel in Lima has a comment, dear Lisa. I'm go sorry. Ahead. Go ahead, Katia. No, I'm sorry. Yes, I am here. I'm sorry. First of all, good morning with everybody. Um, <laughs> I was just trying to look at the presentation again because I had lost and using my mobile. And suddenly I pressed the button, but it was not on purpose. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Don't worry, Katia. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Yes, in fact, I am just listening to all of your comments and I think that I totally agree with it. Just teaching students is totally uh, challenging for us as teachers, right? And now in this time that we are just facing and dealing with virtual lessons, I think that, okay, all of these ideas and all the things that we can share among teachers is really, really useful. And I do really appreciate just being here. I'm sorry for raising my hand. It was not important. It's okay. We're it's all okay. learning. It's okay. Lisa, just a quick question about yeah. virtual classrooms. Um, this, uh, how do we address this issue? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I, <laughs> I don't have that answer. Um, I'm going to show you some things that I've created for next year coming up mm -hmm. that I hope will help address that issue of, you know, like the Ed Puzzle with interactive videos. I've created like screencastifies. So it's much more visual for my students. As far as this, I even think when I get back in the classroom, I don't even know if I'm going to be allowed to do this. Yeah. It's yeah. not social distance. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if they have a mask on, can I still allow them to sit together and work together? Mm -hmm. I don't know. We, you are ahead of me in the sense that our school has ended for you in Latin America, especially, or in um, South America. We're on summer break. So we're just coming into this in about a month. August 10th is our first day of school. Um, so that's, that's gonna become a reality re really soon. Mm -hmm. yes. But I, we have, and I'll show you, save that thought again, I have a little bit. So I'm gonna go through this kind of quickly, but how do we influence the students learning once we um, differentiate content, process, and product? We influence that with opening some different doors. And that is knowing our students' readiness. Um, and you know, for me, I'm starting school online. I don't know if that's gonna be easy or hard for me, but a knowledge of what your students already understand, their skills, how ready are they to learn this topic will help drive what you differentiate. For me, like I said, sometimes I give students um, a more scaffolded note taker where they're just putting in a few words because I understand their skills and that they're not really ready to take as many notes as I would like them to. Um, we influence their learning through their interest. What engages them? What makes them curious? What makes them want to know more? My students will tell you, uh, Kahoot. Can we do a Kahoot? Can we do a Kahoot? Oh my gosh, they love Kahoot. It's like, if I make a Kahoot review game, I've got them hooked. They're all focused and ready to go. I mean, that's something that really interests them. Um, and then knowing a little bit about their learning styles or their learning profiles. Um, what is their preference for taking in content? 
Um, how do they learn best? Um, for mine, a lot of them, because le English is not their first language, a video is just so visual and so catchy for them that they love seeing something in a video that they can watch where they can actually see it and hear it. So these are factors to keep in mind when you're figuring out how to differentiate. So what are you already doing to differentiate instruction in your classroom if you want to share something with that? And then, or you want to say, what are the three parts of a lesson we learned today that we can differentiate? We've heard from a few of you how you've differentiated in your class. What else are you doing? Uh, Liza, here, Roxana. Yes. Uh, one of the things I'm trying to uh, start using now with uh, virtual classes with a student who doesn't speak that much, he doesn't feel much confident, he understands, but he doesn't speak much, and I start to use in audiobooks. No, oh, great. Yes, they are really, really good for them. For him, in this case, is a guy. Yeah. And he listens. Uh, we sometimes go by chapters. Yeah. We pop it. He paraphrases. We check uh, some kind of uh, knowledge and um, understanding. And then the, the, he has daily classes, an hour and a half daily classes. The day after, he tells me what he remembers about the first part. We all the uh, chapter we have already read his opinion and he makes predictions what's going on on the next chapter and oh, it's that's really, awesome. really, really well and that was one of the strategies text on tape or audio book something like that so that's that's beautiful and what grade do you teach and uh, you know this is a uh, business people okay yeah it's a one-to-one -one class and he's in his level of pre-intermediate one what are the good things of this material that we have graded readers you know we have yes. read, for example, the woman in the black uh, coat is yeah. something in history. And he started telling me about his own experiences about this kind of goals and things he has had. And the, he was really, really engaged and into this. Uh, then when we come back to the book, he comes quieter and just uh, close exercises and then get to know better when they, we go into this part that is not part of the program, but complementing, he's really engaged in that. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's that's great. That's wonderful. And it's so cool. Isn't it great to see that success? Yeah. Lisa? Sorry, again? I'm oh, sorry. Again, Lisa? I said, isn't it great to see that success? Yes, exactly. You no. Know? And then uh, that uh, he doesn't, uh, he didn't know exactly about himself that he was going to be able to start speaking that much about a topic that he was not much uh, into the lesson. And mm -hmm. then uh, that's, that's the real purpose of our uh, company in the sense that as long as students are speaking and using the language, we don't have to be that much into the textbook. We have okay. the textbook as a tool. So the okay. flexibility of our company and the possibilities of putting something else that the student really gets engaged, that will make us work a lot better, it's something good. And I think that's great if you can use your textbook as a tool and it doesn't always have to be used verbatim. And sometimes you can or can't. The exactly. picture of those students, we had a textbook and I had to use it, but I could pick which units I taught or which units I taught because there were so many. So I had that freedom and flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, this summer we've been working and we've pretty much been writing our own curriculum, especially with the idea of probably being online more than we would like next year. Mm -hmm. We've had to just really adapt. All right, does anyone remember the three parts of the lesson we differentiate? Content. Content. Process. 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 Product. Perfect. Product. Just Perfect. one comment, Lisa, I want to make is what this brings up for me is you're, you're really creating that opportunity that each student gets a sense that they belong in the classroom. Mm. That sense of belonging really inspires them to say, I belong here and I can learn whatever place I'm at, whatever starting, whatever my starting point is. I like that. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. 
sorry, yeah, there, is, there is one more one one more participant, Lucy Emily. You raise your hand. Yeah. Please. Hi. Hi. Hi, Hi Liza. I, I really would like to share uh, your previous uh, questions because I work uh, in a public school here in, in Callao, in Pachacute, and in a university too. But with my students at public school, uh, the connection is terrible. Uh, we have many problems. But at the beginning, how I discovered uh, the, the differentiated instruction is, in first place, because I love reading, I transmit then uh, some little videos about Anne Frank. Great. Uh, in, in the first time of the lockdown, Fortunately for me, for one thing, I, I planned all my course because it wasn't compulsory. English wasn't compulsory at the beginning. Okay. So, so I started reading something about Anne Frank. Then I searched a lot uh, uh, that in her house, that is now like a virtual museum. Yes. And I took class too. So I said, how can I do with my student? How can I transmit that? Because this little girl who lived many years ago uh, spent a, a similar experience as my students without connection, without many things. So I sent little videos and some, some uh, to one of them, I, I sent um, the link. So yeah. because between yeah. my, I have like 300 students at, and in a school. Eight yeah. classes. Yeah. So in each class, probably one or two have connections. The others not. So they all get I, together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, and I trust me the idea. And I said, I follow them by Facebook, by WhatsApp. And it's only that. Now, after two months of the day read, I differentiate that they love reading too. And now I know who love reading more. Who oh, not. cool. And now I send, now that two weeks ago or three weeks ago, the government opened a web page with our course. Okay. So now I said, okay, do you like or don't like? No means I didn't have the opportunity, but another friend gave me the ideas. And I know, I, I love that little girl. I never heard about Anne Frank. Now all my students, some of them know more, some less, but all of them are involved. I want to share that with you. Oh, that is so cool. I had one year I had this group of kids and it was my reading class and we had this whole reading program. And I discovered that I had about three boys who loved this certain genre of books. Um, and so I had some old ones packed away and I pulled them out and I said, I think you're going to love this story. Do you want to read it? And I gave it to these boys and they would come in before and after school and read because they couldn't take the books home. And they were racing to see who would finish the book first. And they loved the book. And it is that when you can figure out your student's interest and then give them something that will just push them to continue to read or learn or do whatever because you've discovered or unlocked that interest in them. It's just one of the most exciting things as a teacher. Sorry, Lourdes Landa also has a comment. Okay. Yeah, it's a comment on what Lucy has just mentioned about Anna Frank. I'm just also working with, with Anna Frank and my one-to-one -one students, you know, and, um, and it, taking also an idea that Lisa mentioned before, you know, the, the fact of using graded readers depending on the levels and these classic books, you can find them easily for elementary, for advanced, if you really get to read yeah. the, 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 no, the, the, the book, the original book, you know? And, uh, and especially Anna Frank that was also like in quarantine, you know, yes. in oh. lockdown. And it's, um, well, I'm living in the Netherlands, Anna Frank was living, everything happened here, you know, in Amsterdam. And um, the Anna Frank House, the foundation created a video diary. Mm -hmm. So even for people who are not used to reading, but they like these kind of video uh, making vlogs, you know, so you can also have access on YouTube and uh, get to know the story and ask the students to create their own video diaries on how these uh, 
time is uh, is going now it's happening and to record that and and for example I have a student who is also 13 years old and is and she tells me you know I didn't know that she wrote it this at 13 years old uh, being the same age and after the first lesson she had lots of vocabulary way more than the previous one and phrases and so um, Obviously, with my one-to-one -one lessons, you have more like a privilege because it's yeah. focus um, attention. But um, but okay, I got a lot of ideas because I also mm -hmm. spend a lot of time planning different lessons. But uh, with what I have heard today, I've learned to um, avoid that and to be more open to strategies and techniques and, and be able to give them at the right moment, not when they are asking, you know? Yeah. So. I love that you've incorporated that whole quarantine concept with the Anne Frank and, you know, you're kind of like her and create your diary. That's really a clever idea. Yeah. All right, we're, we're gonna skip this because I think you guys do it because I want to go on to the next part, but this is your homework. Um, you know, think of a topic you teach, and I think you've already done a lot of this, but how can you differentiate the content? How could you differentiate the process? And how could you differentiate the product? And why is that good for, or how does that help your students? So I think we've covered a lot of that. So I want to go on to this, because this, I think it's just a cool concept I've learned and I really wanted to share it with you. Um, these are called choice boards and I didn't come up with them. They were shared with me. And this was given to second language learners during the shutdown when we went online. Um, and this is from a different district. So you can see there's broken into listening, reading, speaking, writing, and words. So, this one says complete four activities each week. And again, you could differentiate that. Maybe some of your students can only complete two. And for listening, maybe they have to call a friend or family member and ask and answer questions or ask them to tell you your favorite recipe and then make it. So that's that listening. Reading, um, watch a movie and read along with the closed captions or they could watch a YouTube video. So these were just, I thought, some cool concepts for things we can do with our students as we go online to incorporate all that. So that's a primary, which I don't think any of you are primary. So this is a middle school example. Yeah. I'll leave it up for you to look at. But you can use with any, any level. Yes, you could. You, yes, and you can use that even for, let's say, um, if we are talking about cities. What, when I go, when people come to my city, they can listen to this, let's say, pasillos in Ecuador music. They uh -huh. can read about the middle of the world monument. They can I went there, Spanish. I love that. Uh -huh. They can speak Spanish. They can write letters or they can write postcards or things. And they yeah. might learn, and they might, in the vocabulary, they can learn some vocabulary words, uh, Quechua words mixed with Spanish and that we use, or maybe everything we say with uh, diminutivos, like pancito, raquisito, like things that we use as uh, specifically from our city. So this not only can be used as this, like, it's like a bitácora. I don't know how to say that in Spanish, in English, sorry. But also for an, uh, an exercise on cities, let's say, we, yeah. we usually have that, exile, that kind of topic in our textbooks. And I think, you know, again, talking to differentiation, make a list of 10 synonyms for sad. You could change that for some students to make a list of five. Um, you know, again, this is totally adaptable to meet your students' needs. Um, and then here's a high school one. And you can see this one says choose four out of eight. So they have eight ideas for the first week and they have to do four of them. Um, so I just thought, you know, if you're teaching at the university, this might be something you could use to put together for your students and kind of give them, here's your lessons for the week. 
and you can see, you know, this is linked to Khan Academy. Um, this is linked to, you know, some some story that's probably a, a graded reader. This is linked to a listening activity. Um, so, and then what I, and this will be in the wakelet, so you have access to it. So there's blank ones. So if you really wanted to try something like this, you could download this into Google and fill it in yourself with what you want students to do. So here's what, um, this is what we have been working on in my school district. So these are our standards at the beginning level. This is what the state, some of the things the state says we have to teach. Um, so using singular and plural nouns, common and proper nouns, um, gather information. So we have put together these for teachers. And so this is the family unit. And so basically for listening, there's a presentation that talks about introducing some family terms. And then it's now narrated in case we're online. So I can do this directly through uh, Google Slides I present in my class, or I can have students listen to it at home, or students now have a narrated version if they need to hear it. Um, there's no reading today. Um, there's a chart that they're gonna start filling in. And so I'm gonna show you what this looks like. I'm gonna link it. And it might be too small. I might have to zoom in. Uh, it's not zooming. Oh, there we go. Ah, that's too much. Sorry, guys. Let me go back. Oh, shoot. Ah, darn it. I can't unzoom it. There we go. So this is an eight to 10 day lesson. And so when teachers get this, they basically are linked. I'm just gonna open the preview because I don't wanna make a copy. We forced copies. So then they get, um, they get the whole slideshow. And I don't know if that's too small. And then um, here is, like here's day four, so here's a reading piece. So teachers can open this and students will do this reading piece. It's got three families. And then there's questions. Um, and then I went ahead and turned this into an Ed puzzle. So I actually narrated it in case we're online and they can play it and then the questions are embedded like what I did with you guys. So we've kind of adapted everything using the choice board, but we've made this more for our, our teachers. Um, so they can basically take any of these and link into Google Classroom, Canvas, whatever platform um, you might be using. So I just thought this might be a source for you or an idea for you um, to use when you're working online. And then it goes down, you can see there's a, um, I'm trying to remember all this. So I did this, this is what we did in June. So there's a story model that's also narrated where they have to write a story about their family. Um, and then there's a test here. There's like a summative test and there's formative test in here where it's really walking around and asking people about their family. I think it's lesson four. Yeah, so here's a formative assessment. Um, and then to differentiate, I put a note over here, students can use their notebooks to help answer questions um, if they need to use notes. So just some things I thought might be valuable. Oops. And then here's the resources that are in the one that was, um, that I kind of copied. Some of these aren't free, but some are. Um, and then let's see. And then I put this in the wakelet for you. This is a great little course if you want to do a little bit more on differentiated instruction. 
it goes through different modules and they're very short um, and they're they're pretty uh, informative and then here's uh, some articles oh, I think that's oh that's the same thing sorry that's the course but there's some articles I gave you. And then this is the Wakelet. Jaime, are you able to put that in the chat box? Did I send that to you? Okay. So if you access this, everything, I'll show you. So everything you I've presented is pretty much in here and I've added a few more. So here's the actual presentation. Here's the choice boards if you wanted to have the blank ones to play with. Here's the instructional video. Um, this is Newzella. This is the one that has leveled reading based on Lexiles. So you can choose higher or lower and it's all current events and history stuff. So it's really a great website. And then if you needed some speaking activities, this is Voices of America. They have beginning, intermediate, and advanced videos. There's like 52 videos in a series where students can listen, and I think they repeat in them. So I've just tried to add in everything plus a couple additional pieces. So here's that link again for the Wakelet. All right, I've talked way too much. Your turn. Do you see the choice boards is something you could maybe use? We, I presented them to a group of teachers in our districts online virtually, of course, and I was surprised that everyone bought into them. So it's a complete paradigm shift for us. But now that we've done it, we're really excited and think we've kind of stumbled onto something that will be very useful for educators, um, especially as we go forward with the unknown and we really, we will hear next, we'll hear in about four or five days what our school year will look like. Um, they've had a task force of parents, students, teachers, community members, they have all been meeting to say what they think is going to be best as we reopen schools in August. And so our, our board is looking at those and next week we're supposed to know how we will go back to school and most of us feel like it's going to be a hybrid where maybe kids come two days a week for longer days, like a block. So um, half the kids come Tuesday, Wednesday, and then the other half come Thursday, Friday, and then everybody's online Monday. I don't know. So we're waiting for that news. So I'm in limbo. Um, we do know that August 10th, we start online um, because our governor has said we cannot go back in person because the cases have drastically increased in Arizona. The heat does not kill the virus, I will tell you that. <laughs> so thoughts of what you've learned, what you can use, things you want to share with your colleagues, this is your time. Personally, I like the Ed Puzzle. Isn't that cool? I think that's a great tool, yeah. So, and I'm sure you can find all list of topics, not only, you know, teaching English as a second language, but also different topics, it's just in case you teach adults like, I don't know, linguistics or pronunciation, or I don't know, if you are in a psychology field, it can be probably included, um, you know, personalities or sociolinguistics even. So. Uh, so I think that that was a very interesting tool. And the fact that you can control uh, making the pauses in the video and including the question, that, that, that was very, very, very appealing for me. So thank you. Thank you for but, sharing. Yeah. Um, Irma, the other thing I was going to tell you about that is you can take any video. So, I mean, like you said, any content. So if you have to teach something on, <clears throat> you know, welding, you could find a welding video from YouTube. You just in, you load it into your Ed Puzzle. So, yeah, it's, and when you create okay. an account, you can see other people's. So go to edpuzzle.com. Okay. It's also a Chrome extension. So you okay. can 
and I'm sure you can right. find a video how to use it. It's very simple. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sure. Yeah. I'm going to start playing with it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, another resource I wanted to share is that I, I Firefox, uh, um, Mozilla Firefox has also this picture in picture. So you can play the video and then you can, and, and then when you put picture in picture is a, a blue square there, then a box, you can play, uh, place it somewhere and you can continue with your, let's say, with another document while the, while the video is playing. So I did this, I, 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 I discovered this last, this week. So for my classes yesterday, I did like a listening exercise with my students with the video and the worksheet uh, at the same time. So, and, 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 and it worked. Um, so it is picture in picture with okay. the videos in, in uh, Firefox, in Mozilla Firefox. I'm gonna it is, and what did you say again, the source? Uh, it's picture in picture. If you open Mozilla and you play one YouTube video, it just, this box, little box appears there. And uh -huh. then you click on that on that box and you can work with both, the, the, let's say, with another document while you're playing the, the video. And is it spelled okay. just like it sounds, picture in? In, uh, pic, in, uh -huh. picture, Letter in, picture, uh-huh. So it is there. Uh, I, I, it, I thought, I don't, it, it was, it was Tuesday, I just found out that. And I'll then, have to look up that one, that sounds great. Uh-huh, yes, yeah. so because yesterday I was working with that. Mm -hmm. And thank you for your, your ideas. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, dear Liza Wakefield. Uh, I, I just want to remark that all the guest speakers do not charge any single penny or cent <laughs> or dollar. And we appreciate the time they, they share with us. And because, uh, as Liza said, it was 7.30 a.m. when she started <laughs> presenting, so she couldn't sleep that much. And mm. yesterday was the 4th of July, <laughs> and the fireworks didn't uh, let her sleep well. And thank you, everyone, for being here. We are a very good uh, number of professionals <laughs> and passionate people. And tomorrow in Peru, I don't know in, if your countries, it's Teacher's Day. Oh, it is. Oh. Yeah, tomorrow, tomorrow, okay. <laughs> not today. So thank you very much, Tania, Raj, Roxana, Irma. Is that your name, Irma? Yes. Um, uh, Irma, where are you from? Uh, you know me, I'm from here, Guayaquil. Ah, Irma from Guayaquil. Ah. I, ah. <laughs> That's I, you, you, you know her by Ilka. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ilka, you know Il my other nickname. Name, name Ilka. is Ilka Guzman. Ilka. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's because I have a, a, a headache, a terrible headache, and a little oh, bit. Oh, sorry. Some fever, and 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 yes, sorry, sorry. Besides, I'm 56 today. <laughs> and Lourdes, and Malena, no problem. And Happy everything. birthday. No, no. It's in the 10th of July. I'll be 57. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> but thanks anyway, Lucy, Gloria, Carlo Magno, Nora, Mirela, Edwin, Maria, Elena, Christy Love. Wow, I like that. Yeah, Christy Love. Christy Love, are you there? Christy Love, no, she's not. Katia, Adrian Zen in Lima, Priscilla, uh, Milva, and Edison. Uh, next Sunday, we will have Mercy Linda Ortiz from Guatemala. She oh. will be. She will be talking about Google G Suit for education. I don't know what it is. Do you know what it is? Oh, G, G Suite. Um, it's part of Google and they're all the things they have to offer. Okay. So, if you if you don't know like 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 me, please be present and she'll be talking about that. And the other months, next next we will have uh, Elizabeth Ortiz from Ecuador. She will be talking about Teaching for Peace, a 21st Century Challenge. And then uh, Marina Gonzalez from Argentina, she will be talking about finding opportunities in times of chaos. As you can, ah, and next month, next month we will have uh, Edison from Ecuador, 
Julio Valladares from Peru, and I don't know who else. Ah, yeah, uh, we'll have um, Mary Scholl from, from the USA and other people. So thank you very much. Thank you, have a very nice weekend. Thank you one more time, Liza. Uh, blessings, thank you very much for your time, your ideas and your wisdom. It was my pleasure. Thank you for letting me do this. It's always a treat to be with international educators. I love working with teachers all over the world. So thanks for the time. Thank you. Have okay, a great thank you very much, Liza. Thank you very much. I am here. I am here. Okay. And I would like, Kaime, uh, 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 you have to please send us the material so we yes, can. Yes, yes, I will. Take advantage, I will send take you advantage of those happy. ideas, please. Yes, yes. And, and I will share with you the video too. And I will send the link that Lisa gave to me. She yeah, sent it to me. the wakelet. The way everything's in the wakelet. So if you have that code, you're good. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Bye, thank guys. You so have Bye, everyone. Good See you Goodbye. next time. Thank you, Lisa. Everybody, thank bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.